All right, so today we're going to continue working in section 3.2, which is addition of whole numbers, and we are going to pick up where your video left off last time on basic addition strategies. And um, some of these are probably ones you've used, and others of them you might be like, oh, I never thought about it that way before. Um, but they're all good to have sort of a, um, a basic idea of some of the strategies that your students in your class will learn, or maybe they'll have come to your class with from someone else. Um, so the first one is called counting on. It's used with addition. Um, there's other, another counting on with subtraction later. That's why it's identified that way. So you start with one of the values that you're adding together, and then you count up the additional amount of the other value. So imagine that you had, right, like 3 plus 7. So you start with 7, and then you go 8, 9, 10. You'd count up the last 3. The number you end on is your answer. You notice a lot of kids seem to do that. It's a very common one, yeah. Um, doubles is something that has come about more recently um, in the last maybe a decade or so. So probably since you've been in elementary school, but you may have seen kids doing this. So the idea is that if we have children who know what the doubles are, right? So like they know what 1 plus 1 and 2 plus 2 and 3 plus 3 and 4 plus 4, that they can make use of that knowledge for the ones that aren't doubles. So it feels very counterintuitive for those of us who just memorized the facts, you know, without any of that going on behind the scenes. But for kids who know doubles, this is a good strategy, and then you will see it being used in more of the current curriculums. So for example, if a kid knows that 3 plus 3 is 6, and they're doing 3 plus 4, they might think of 3 plus 4 as 3 plus 3 plus 1. I already know what 3 plus 3 is. It's 6, and I just need one more than that, so now it's 7. Okay? So that's doubles. And the last strategy for the moment that we're going to look at, basic strategies, is called making 10. So making 10 is a really nice strategy. If you have a whole collection, we'll look at these uh, another similar strategy later where you have a whole collection of numbers and you're sort of picking out the ones that nicely add to 10. This is kind of like that. So for example, 8 plus 6 is certainly not 10. But I can break the 6 down into 2 plus 4. And why might I want to? Well, because 8 plus 2 is 10. And once I have my 10, I can add the four that are remaining afterwards. Okay, so that's, that's making tens. Now we're going to actually look at some concrete uh, or some addition algorithms. The first one is the concrete model. So concrete typically means you can touch and feel something, right? It, we don't really mean like the pavement outside. That's not what we mean when we say concrete. Touch and feel. Okay, so the concrete model would be the idea of using maybe the, um, and I keep forgetting to bring them. One of these days I'll remember and be like, oh, that's right. She told us she was going to eventually bring those. My base 10 blocks, right? Okay, so the base 10 blocks is a fantastic way to do a concrete model. And in some sense, it works even better than like um, money or something like that because you can visually see how the, you know, how the pieces stack together to make something bigger. Whereas, like, I don't visually see how 10 pennies turn into a dime. Like, that visually doesn't make sense. But the concrete model using base 10 blocks is really friendly. So what the idea is here is to take, for example, 34. 34 is three longs. So we have one long here, two longs, and three longs, okay? And then I have four units. So this is the number 34, and I'm going to add to that another long and eight units. Okay, so visually, I have a bunch of essentially like Legos. You could even use Legos for this if you wanted to, right? It would work. Um, and the idea is to actually do kind of what I mentioned on that problem you were looking at, Kayla, where I would do regrouping. So I'm piecing these together. I'm working in base 10. We're, we're working in base 10 on this problem. And so I need 10 of the little unit blocks to make along. So I do that. I take 10 of them. So here's 8, and there's 2 more. And I take these and combine them. And when I do that, I end up with another long. So now I already had... The, four, the three longs from the first one. And 
And then I had one long from the second one, right? And now I have an additional long. Those are all the long pieces now that I have that I did not have when I started the problem. Not all of them anyway. And then the two that I, you know, didn't use and didn't trade up are my individual units. I'll just put them over here on the right. So the result here, and I don't know that I want to do that. The result here is this. And how many longs do I have? I have five longs, and I have two units for the number 52. So there's always, kind of like with our Egyptians and our Babylonians and Mayans, there's always good and bad to any of the strategies I'm going to teach you, even the ones that you think are the best because you know them really well. They have flaws, too. Um, we've just probably decided as a collective whole that the flaws are sort of worth the efficiency or something like that. This is really, really good at giving a basic sense of the value of places, right? I'm not looking at this last problem and tempted to say, oh, look, it's seven. I wouldn't add the longs and the little tiny units together. They're different sizes. Visually, it wouldn't make any sense. Okay? That's a good pro to this, right? I get a real good sense of what it means to be a long. You know, or a ten tens place is where we, you know, see it used when we actually write our numbers out. What does it mean for the number to be in the tens place? What does it mean for the number to be in the ones place? Um, obviously, we don't want to do this when we get to larger values. I don't want to be drawing pictures every time. It's not efficient. It's going to take up a lot of space. I'm going to have to be trading things around a lot. It's not a terribly efficient way to do things. But when kids are first learning about place value addition, we're looking at first grade here probably, somewhere maybe toward the end of kindergarten or the beginning of second, depending on how you know, the curriculums overlap, right? But this is, this is first grade kind of stuff where you would be using concrete models. The next one is the one that you know and love. It's called standard algorithm. So <clears throat> one of the things with the standard algorithm, of course, is that we, we stack our numbers, you know, sort of on top of each other like this, right? And what do we add first? Four and the eight. And why is that maybe not the most intuitive thing to do? Yeah, it's not the way we read. We read, and we do most everything else, from left to right. And now I'm doing math from right to left, and that's not super intuitive. Unless really you're just, Hebrew. Huh? Unless you're Hebrew. Well, and, then, and there's some other, there's some other um, like language systems that don't do that, too. But for most of us, you know, and all of us who are speaking English anyway, that's not a very intuitive thing to do. So I'm adding it together, and so let's go ahead and do it then. 4 plus 8 is... 12, and what do I do? Hmm? I carry the one, and did you know they don't call it that anymore? What? I know. They call it regrouping. They call it regrouping. It's all over my kids' stuff coming from the elementary schools these days. Regrouping. For the last several years, anyway, in the curriculums that I've had coming home into my house since my fifth grader was in first grade. So for a little while, they call it regrouping. So that's sort of interesting, right? We just put a two down. We moved the one somewhere else. And then what do we do? Then we add the one, the three, and the one to give me a five. So of course it gives us the right answer. So any idea why you think they might have changed the language from carrying, which physically looks like what we're doing, to regrouping? There is a good reason for it, by the way. Yeah, yeah, you got, you got the right idea. So this is the tens place, right? And this is the ones place. So when I add my two numbers together and I get a, the four and the eight, and I get a 12, a 12 is one ten and two ones. So the two gets written in the ones column, and the, the, the two gets written in the ones column, and the one gets regrouped into the tens column because that's what its value actually is. The one's value is that it's a 10, so it's now put into the tens column. 
That's why the language is regrouping. Now, on the flip side, this is exceptionally efficient. You can redo this process with longer values, with many values in a row added together. It's a very efficient process, which is probably why we've settled there as a society for the most part. Now, this one is interesting. Um, this is called the expanded algorithm, and it's kind of a blend between the concrete model you saw, but it's not going to have any pictures, and the standard algorithm that you saw that had this sort of new language of regrouping. So take a look at what this one looks like. What we're going to do instead of writing, there's a couple of different ways to do it. I'll show you the one that I kind of like the best, but then I'll show you the other one that your book shows too, is to re rewrite this as 30 plus 4 and 10 plus 8. Okay? This is the one that I kind of like the best. So you're separating it by place value, definitely. You can think of it really nicely in terms of bills, right? Like dollar bills and tens bills and hundreds bills. Ignore the fact that we've got fives and twenties. They're not helpful in this discussion, but well, ones and tens and hundreds are great. Um, and then you're going to do the same sort of thing. So you can actually go from left to right or right to left in what I'm about to do. So this gives me a 40 here and it gives me 18 here. I'm sorry, not 18, 12 here. And then you're going to do the same thing with the 12. So you're going to have 40, 10, and 2. So you're breaking the 12 apart. And then the 40 plus 10 is 50. I, I realize I've written like a gazillion steps. You wouldn't necessarily need to write a gazillion steps. But this is the idea behind what's happening, is the breaking it apart by place value. So the thing that you see happen, and you actually see it happen here, is you see that 1 being regrouped with the 40 instead of being left grouped with the 2. And that's very friendly, um, very intuitive. Now, the other way that you can see this written is um, you can actually see it written times 10. So you can do like 3 times 10 plus 4 times 1, and 1 times 10 plus 8 times 1. So you're physically writing what it, the value is times its place value, much more like expanded form from section one. And again, I have 12 ones, and I have, um, oops, four tens. And then I would break my 12 ones into one ten and two ones. And there's my four tens to combine it with. So now I have five tens and two ones for 52. It's fine to do it that way. I think there's just a little bit more writing that's not really all that useful, maybe. Um, it doesn't shed any more light on it than the left-hand one that I did already. It's just a little bit more cumbersome. Does that make sense? You can see the regrouping happening. Okay, we have... A whole other page. You had no idea there were so many strategies, did you? Yeah, I got four more. Column addition. So some of our methods work better when you have bigger numbers or smaller numbers. They just do. So you'll notice my examples themselves kind of changing as we're going our way through because I'm trying to show you an example where it actually makes sense to use it or how it might be practical to see it used and not just showing the same example 10 different times in a 10 different strategies or whatever. You know, like that's not necessarily super helpful. So this one works pretty nicely when you're adding longer digit numbers together. So like this is four digits time, uh, plus four digits. So again, we're going to stack them up, okay? This is really um, maybe one of my favorite strategies. I like the stuff that we just did in the last one, the expanded one. I think it's very helpful in terms of place value, so for a younger child. But as you get to sort of bigger numbers, this one works really nicely because you get to work from left to right. So they're calling it the column addition algorithm. If you used our older edition of our book, they used to call it the left to right algorithm. So if you just want to write it next to this, the whole point is that this goes from left to right. That is what this strategy is all about. So we're actually going to start on the left-hand side. So we're going to add 1 plus 3 together to give me a grand whopping 4. And it's 4 in the thousands place. So 
essentially what I just did is I added, uh, which one was first, 1,000 plus 3,000. That's, that's really what that step's all about. 1,000 plus 3,000 is 4,000. And then I'm going to go to the hundreds place. I've got the 5 and the 2, so that's a 7. So again, essentially, you don't need to show the steps I'm writing on the side where I'm writing the 1,000 plus 3,000, but I'm letting you know that's what we're really doing. Really, we added 500 and 200. Okay? Tens column, I have 3 and 1, that's 4, so 40. Again, I really added 10 and 30. 30 and 10, I don't care which order you want to put it in. And then the left one, um, the, not left, the far right one then is the numbers 4 plus 8. Now, it's the first time I've actually gotten something that's two digits, so I wanted to show you how it happens and what you do with it. 4 plus 8 is 12, of course. We've seen that one happen multiple times. But you just write it as 12. There's no regrouping. Okay? Again, not necessarily all that efficient because it took me several steps to get there. But what happens next is whether I move from left to right or right to left is all my addition is going to add straight down. So this is 4,752. Left to right or right to left, either way. Because I have a whole lot of zeros now. Right? Zeros are very friendly to add with. Very friendly. So that's column addition. Okay, lattice algorithm. Um, we have a lattice algorithm for addition. We're also going to have a lattice algorithm for multiplication in a few class periods away from now. Um, go ahead and stack them, much like you did on the previous problem. And underneath them, I want you to write a rectangle, or draw a rectangle. And then I want you to split your rectangle into four boxes. And the reason we're using four boxes is because we're working with four-digit numbers. Okay, so if we did three-digit numbers, we'd have three boxes. If we did a five-digit number, we'd have five boxes and so on. Okay, then you're going to divide your boxes in half like this across the diagonal. And this is why it's called lattice. So this is a very basic lattice image. Here's what you do. Again, you can work from left to right or right to left, doesn't matter. But each of the numbers that are going to be added are going to be put in the box that's beneath it. So let me just start on the left-hand side. 1 plus 3, of course, is 4. And I put the 4 down here, oops, in the bottom corner. So it's the box that's directly underneath it, but it's the right-hand corner. Now when I move over to the tenth or the hundredths place, I have 8 plus ten, 2, which is 10. So I put the 1 in the top and a 0 down here. So that's what I do with two-digit numbers. So I never add together more than, I never, when I add together, I never get more than two digits. So I have a place for both values. Um, I have a 9 and a 1, that's another 10. And then I have that same 4 and 8 that keeps coming up, and that's a 12. So about like this. Okay, so again, I didn't regroup anything. I didn't. Um, I just sort of placed it underneath the value that it corresponded to. So the last step then is to take those diagonals that you just made and extend them outside your box. And now we have to start in the bottom right hand corner. We do have to actually start in a specific location. The number is a 2, so I'm going to rewrite the 2 down here. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to add along my diagonals. So the second diagonal, which would be right here, means I'm going to add the 1 and the 0 together, which of course gives me a 1. And then my next diagonal is this 1 and a 0, which gives me another 1. And then the next diagonal is a 4 and a 1, which gives me a 5. Now you might be thinking, okay, but what if I had something that added up to not a single digit? Like what if it added up to 12 as I did a diagonal? Well, then you do carry just like you would have before, okay? You do regroup. So you got a 12, you put the 2 underneath it in that diagonal location, and then you carry it over to the next diagonal. Okay, so maybe I should pause right here just to remind you 
that while we're working with different algorithms, and I absolutely, if I ask you to, to do something with lattice algorithm, I expect to see lattice algorithm and so forth, that doesn't mean that you have all of a sudden, you know, thrown your calculator in the trash can or thrown aside any other algorithms that you ever knew. You should be able to check yourself with some other algorithm or with your calculator to verify that you didn't make a mistake. Okay, so I would encourage you when you get to the end of this problem to go back, grab a calculator or grab you know, your standard algorithm that you know and love and just add it together and make sure it really is 5112. Okay, and if it's not, then go back and look for your mistake. And if you can't find it, then seek some help from somebody else to try and find your mistake. Okay, because, you know, we still have all the same tools that we had before. I'm just adding more tools to your toolkit. All right, opposite change algorithm. Um, this is a new one with this particular edition of the book. Um, I think this one's a really cool one as well. Um, so when we're looking at this, we'll start by taking our numbers and again stacking them, 488 uh, and 231. And the goal with opposite change is to turn things into zeros because we like to add with zeros. They're very, very friendly. Agreed? You bet. So what we're going to do is we're going to make zeros happen. For example, if I added a 2 to the first number, I'd get a 0 in the 1's place. You can't just go adding 2's. It's not okay. It had to come from somewhere, right? So I have to compensate. If I add the 2 from one place, I have to take it away from another spot. That's the opposite change. So the first one is now 490. The second one is now 229. But again, again, my goal is to get lots of zeros. I want them to all be zeroed out at the end, one of the numbers. And I've already been working with the 490. Don't switch now and try to work with the 229. That's just really silly. You need to pick which one you're going to work with. If you, want, if, you, if you had wanted to work with the 231, you could have. That would have been fine. But I chose to work with the first one. So I can add 10 here. That would be a nice thing to do. But if I add 10, I also have to subtract 10. It's a balance. So 490 plus 10 would be 500. 229 minus 10 would be 219. And this addition is beautifully 719 then. Fun, right? Yeah. So, you know, jot yourself down a note. The goal is to get one of the numbers to have zeros everywhere. That's really what you want. Lots of zeros. Um, if you really wanted to, you could take it a step further if the numbers were big enough and get a zero in the, in the hundreds place. Like, maybe this number wasn't 500 to start with. It was like 900. You're like, man, you know, 1,000 would be easier than 900. I'll just add 100 to it. You could do it in the hundreds place as well and, and continue the process. Okay, the next one and the last new algorithm for us for today is called the scratch algorithm. Scratch algorithm, you'll notice, has I've got small digits here. I don't have anything. I mean, they're just two-digit numbers. But you'll notice the scratch algorithm is going to be very useful when we're adding lots of numbers together. So I mean not length of the numbers, but the number of numbers. Here's There's four things I'm adding together. Okay? If you're just adding two things together, scratch algorithm is worthless. It doesn't make any sense. But if you're adding three numbers or four numbers or five numbers or ten numbers together, it becomes useful. So let's take a look at this one. Again, we're going to stack them. 34, 18, 69, and 87. Now, if you'll remember back to learning your addition facts with maybe flashcards or something like that, <clears throat> most flashcard decks go up to single, they used they only do single digit addition. And you'll see more of them now for whatever reason going up to 12 plus 12s. I have no idea why we want to add 12s to everything, but apparently that's the new thing to do is add and multiply by 12s. I don't know. Um, but single digit addition is, the, is what this process is going to rely on. So you guys are far more likely to be able to tell me what 9 plus 7 is than what 19 plus 17 is. Because you know a 9 plus 7 addition fact from somewhere way back when, right? So that's what this method does. So we're going to start in the ones column, okay? And we're going to start at the top. 4 plus 8 is 12. We've been doing that all day, right? 4 plus 8 is 12. So here's what you do. When you get to the 12, I'm going to change colors just to make it very distinguishable. If you want to change colors, great. If not, it's fine. 
I'm going to scratch it. Once I hit a number, I need something brighter than that. Once I hit a number that is 10 or bigger, I'm going to scratch. Okay, so I get a two-digit number, I scratch. My number was 12. Agreed? I'm going to stop thinking about 12, and I'm only going to remember the ones digit, which is a 2. So ignore that I got 12. I scratched to compensate for that. And remember that I have a 2. So now I need 2 plus 9, and that will give me 11. And I would scratch again. But my number is 11, and I'm only going to remember the ones place, which means I'm going to remember a 1. Whoops. And then I have 1 plus 7, which gives me 8. So the value at the bottom of my list right now is an 8. And then you go count your scratches. Because every time you scratched, you ignored the fact that you had, had a 10. That's what you really did. You said, forget about the 10, put it away for now, you ignore it, whatever. Well, now you go back and count. There's two of them. I have two red scratches on mine, so I'm going to carry a 2. Regroup a 2. And we're going to do the same thing in the tens column. And we just keep going until we hit a number bigger than 10, or bigger than 10 or bigger. So 2 plus 3 is, plus 1 is, 6 plus 6 is 12. So I scratch, and I remember the 2, because it's the ones digit. 2 plus 8 is 10, so I would actually scratch, and the ones digit in the number 10 is a 0. And then I go back up and I count my scratches. There are two of them. I would regroup the two to the hundreds column. In this case, there's nothing in the hundreds column, so it's 208. Okay? So let me think with you and run back through this. If you were using the standard algorithm, why this is better, or at least maybe more um, simple. 4 plus 8 is 12. 12 plus 9 is 21. 21 plus 7 is 28. So as you're working your way through, you had to do it in the higher values, right? I'm adding a bigger value every time, whereas when I scratch, I simplify the process down into single-digit addition again. So that's the idea. Okay. I think I have time for my next two problems, maybe at least one of them. And we'll just, we're just going to keep going. These are long sections, and then there's shorter sections later. It'll all balance itself out in the end. I'm not worried about it. So you shouldn't be either. Do you remember our other addition bases? Oh, so much fun. We're going to look at base 8. Base 8 goes from 0 to 7, right? Absolutely. So we're going to look at how we do addition inside of base 8. Yeah, that's what we're going to do. All right, so... We're taking our number 34 base 8 plus 17 base 8. And I'm going to write it vertically 34 and 17. And this is in base 8. And we're going to add. <clears throat> I would like to show you some of them with the standard algorithm, some of them with other algorithms, just so that you can get a feel for how they work with other addition bases, other bases for addition. So let's say, for instance, that we work this one and we work from left to right, column addition, okay? So 3 plus 1 is 4. So we're good with that, no problem. I've got a 4 and a 0. Problem is 4 plus 7 is actually 11, right? Well, even in our system, 11 is two digits, right? But what is it in base 8? So what is the number 11 in base 8? Well, it has to be so many 8s. Uh, let me write it like this. And so many 1s. 11. How many 8s are there in 11? 1. Which would leave me with how many left over? Three. We're regrouping. I have 11 single dollar bills, and I'm making one group of $8, and then I'm making the group of the leftovers. I have one group of eights, three left over. So what I actually have here is a one and a three. 
another way you could do that. Let's think about remember that counting up strategy, Brooklyn, that you said, I see kids using that, right? So let's say we were doing the counting up strategy. Let's start with seven. So we're supposed to go seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, right? But in base eight, there's no eight. So what comes after seven in base eight? One zero, one one, one two, one three. I've counted up four, right? And I've landed at one three inside of base eight. And this is 50, or sorry, 5, 3, not 53, but 5, 3, base 8. All right, we'll jump back in with the next example next time.